Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You can come and sit here in the front. So I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting uh, interaction. I'll just spend a few minutes giving some overview of my latest book, uh, which is titled Being Different. And as the uh, introduction said, uh, the focus is to find out how things are different rather than how they are similar. In reality, there's both similar and difference, differences. Uh, you know, if one wants, one can look for similarities. If one wants, one can look for differences. But differences are what make uh, a civilization useful, resourceful, unique. It has something special to offer to others because of what is distinct. So, and difference doesn't mean superiority. It doesn't mean inferiority. It just means different. Like, you know, one fruit is different from another. Not because it's better or worse. And I also explain that according to our philosophy, difference is a very character, deep character of the cosmos. Things are individual and different. And difference is not a problem that you have to solve. It's not a problem that things are different. It's just the nature of things. So you can also celebrate differences. You don't have to consider it a problem or, or a threat or something that you have to deal with in a manner as though it's an issue. So uh, my own background is, is uh, as a corporate person. I was originally trained as a physicist, and then I uh, became a computer scientist and entered the corporate world. And then I became a management consultant in uh, global strategies for large multinationals, Fortune 50 type, uh, to help them you know, acquire, merge, joint venture, different technology uh, enterprises. And then I left and... Uh, started my own companies in IT, had uh, 20 companies in different countries uh, in the technology sector. And then in the early, early mid 1990s, I decided that I'll quit and uh, start a different kind of life. Just to, just wanted to learn more about uh, my own uh, spiritual experiences, which I was having at that time. And I wanted to understand them better and spend more time in my own pursuits and also to educate myself about, uh, about matters of civilization which had not been part of my very narrow education. Because if you are trained in science or technology or one of these fields in the Indian system, and I, I went to St. Stephen's College, Delhi University, and like most places, uh, you learn something very narrow very, in a very deep way, uh, which has its advantages, but not a very wide, uh, you know, wide humanities education. So I wanted to educate myself, and that's what I've done for the last 17 years. Uh, my foundation does work in the same areas that I'm interested in, through conferences and grants to scholars and so on. And now I've started writing my own, uh, my own books. The, um, uh, the first, one of the first areas we decided to make an impact was Indian approaches to psychology and mind which is the whole, the whole, all the traditions about mind, meditation, uh, you know, the nature of consciousness, that sort of an approach. And this started when I got a grant proposal from IIT Kharagpur. I gave a talk yesterday there. But I got a proposal when they were celebrating their 50th anniversary. Now they're celebrating their 60th anniversary. So that was a decade ago. And in that grant proposal, they wanted funding to do conferences. And one of the conferences that attracted my attention was on mind, mind science. So I said to them, I'm very interested in mind science, but show me the details. And the details they sent me showed that all the speakers would be talking about Western models of mind. Freud and Jung and all the Western thoughts of the nature of mind, the nature of psychology. So I wrote back that uh, this is sort of disappointing. I, I would like to fund this, but I want at least one panel to talk about Indian, Indian ideas of mind. Because Indian ideas of mind have been very old and uh, basic, uh, very foundational to our philosophy is the nature of mind and what the issues are and how to resolve them. And I got this letter, which I still have on file, which says, you know, we're not chauvinists, we're scientists, and we, we don't want to be, we're secularists. So they had a very negative idea about someone wanting to talk from a scientific point of view, Indian models of uh, psychology. 
So what I did is I got hold of uh, several of my Western friends who are very deeply involved in Indian models of psychology. One of them is a Buddhist teaching at Columbia University and uh, he's, uh, he's a practitioner and uh, you know, a scholar on Indian inner sciences, Adhyatma Vidya as we call it. Another had done a translation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra and he was teaching at Cambridge. Another one was a practitioner of Kundalini. Uh, another one was a Sri Aurobindo follower. So these are all Westerners. So I called them up and said that I want to, you to create a panel and go to India and explain to them Indian contributions. But don't hide the Indian sources. Don't translate the Sanskrit with Western words. Use the original and show them how, where you learnt it from. Because each of them had a guru, each, some of them had, a, had been in Rishikesh for 20 years, they'd all learnt. Some of them had been initiated by the Dalai Lama in a very formal way. So I said, Why don't, I don't want you to hide any of that. Be very open, tell them your own story, tell them what you learnt, why it's useful, and how you teach it in the West, and why it's good for humanity. So I convinced them, and I sent these uh, abstracts to IIT Kharagpur, and immediately they accepted the panel, because now it was Westerners who were going to be talking about, you know, Indian models. So no longer it was considered to be something incorrect for them to do, because Westerners were talking about it. And when these Westerners came and spoke, they got a standing ovation. So this launched a whole program we started uh, in different parts of India, in Kerala, in Pondicherry, in Chennai, in Delhi University. We, we had one conference after another on Indian models of uh, mind and psychology. And today there's about 150 to 200 Indian psychology professors uh, in different parts of the country who uh, specialize in teaching on Indian approaches to psychology. So it's a new thing, a new discipline has been created. Uh, I just gave a talk on this new book at University of Delhi and the psychology department decided to teach an MA course using this book. So the idea that India has something to offer in the discipline of psychology is now taken seriously. So that's one example. Another is we wanted to uh, document in a very academically rigorous way Indian contributions to science and technology. Many of you might know that somebody called Joseph Needham in Cambridge did 30 volumes on China's contributions to science and technology. And this made a whole difference all over the world because wherever China is studied, that set of volumes is used as a reference. And it shows that Chinese are not some otherworldly, mystical, primitive people. They also had a great tradition of, uh, you know, intellectual tradition. Nobody has done something like that for India. There are things written here and there, they're scattered. And some are very good quality, reliable, some are not. So we decided uh, in the late 90s that we should do this project and we came up with a plan to do 20 volumes. And uh, this project has produced nine volumes so far. They are available, they're published. Another four or five are in the pipeline. So we are trying to also create this kind of a collection of Indian contributions to science and technology. That's another uh, area of my interest. I'm now interested in looking at Indian models of sustainability because it's, when you go around India, you look at certain techniques like water harvesting that have been utilized in traditionally. Uh, these are very innovative methods of uh, sustainability and also the philosophy of sustainability which is very deep in Indian culture uh, as opposed to you know, depleting the environment, a short term view, a selfish view which seems to have dominated the world uh, discourse today. Uh, so I'm interested in that. Uh, we are also interested in educational models using Indian methods of learning. Uh, in the U.S. there is a popular, popular uh, wave called accelerated learning. Accelerated learning means your child can learn very fast. They teach you in two years what you would normally learn in five years. And so I started looking at the background of where this came from. And uh, most of the accelerated learning uh, leaders today uh, attributed to a pioneer called Lozanov. Lozanov, who now is in his 90s, lives in Austria. Uh, I think he was Polish originally, uh, or some, some from, the, from, that, from the former Soviet bloc. And they attribute him as the person who founded this new method of learning, which combines the left brain and the right brain, the analytical side and the artistic side to learn. So I started doing research on Lozanov's background, and I found that during the uh, Soviet era, in the 1950s, 
he was sent to India by the Soviet Union to find out how what uh, they had heard that uh, uh, they had heard claims that yogis have some extraordinary powers, some huge higher powers, and the Soviets wanted to know if there are some military applications of that. That if if uh, if things called siddhis can be acquired, then maybe there can be military applications of they could have a battalion of people with siddhis or something. So Soviets sent him to study uh, traditional spiritual masters and see if they have any special powers. And he came back and said that the one power he found very for sure is that they have extraordinary memories because they can memorize the Vedas and Mahabharata, they can memorize 100,000 verses and, and keep and recite it flawlessly. And he was trained in neuroscience and he, at that time neuroscience did not think such huge memory is possible. So then he kept going back to learn how this is done and afterwards he d defected and uh, uh, then UNESCO started sending him to India to study how, uh, you know, pundits who develop all these extraordinary memories, how they achieve it. And he came up with some uh, so good, good uh, description. One of them was that the, the intonation, the musical effect, the rhythm with which they are memorizing uh, has an effect on the, the memory. Uh, something you memorize with the rhythm you rep or, or something which is storytelling that, that goes into your uh, right brain, uh, the creative part of the brain. So when, you are, when you're educating a child with music or with storytelling, it's more likely to stay in the memory longer term. And he started using this to teach people how to learn languages very quickly. He demonstrated that in six months you could learn a quick, uh, some amount of language like you would normally learn in two years. So Lozanov actually brought these new models of accelerated learning from there comes the whole accelerated learning across the United States. Most people don't know. Uh, so this is a, an Indian tradition exported uh, and then the origins forgotten. So I'm interested in such ideas and bringing them back, uh, back here. Uh, it's also, I've shown in this book that, that one of the characteristics of uh, Indian ethos and Indian civilization is a lot of creativity, improvisation, the way music is improvised, the way cooking, cuisine is improvised, it's not fixed, there are no music scores in a raga. It, it's quite amazing to Western musicians when I tell them that this beautiful music you are hearing, they have no written scores that they are following. It's from within and if the same person plays the raga next time it will be a little different. So this is quite interesting for Westerners, the, the amount of improvisation that is done. And uh, uh, cooking the same way the Western style of fixed recipes that you know you take so many ounces of this and you cook you heat it to so many degrees for so many minutes that is not necessarily how the chef does the job it's by feel and and by intuition and so it is highly uh, improvised and different each time he can he, he has that feel is developed so the art is a question of developing the feel for it and similarly dance so if you look at uh, the improvisation, the flexibility, the adaptability, uh, this is a very deep uh, uh, character of uh, Indian civilization. It also means that uh, people can assimilate new things. They're not stuck in one thing. Uh, they can learn. They can think out of the box. Uh, this is different than I found other civilizations, to, relatively speaking. It's not that black and white kind of a thing, but I'm very interested in studying this. And I have a lot to say on this in this book, what, what is the origins of uh, art and uh, uh, general creativity and flexibility in the, in, the Indian, in the Indian ethos. I'm also interested in looking at Indian approaches that are unique in leadership and governance uh, because there are different, traditionally governance was different in this country. And we've now followed a system of governance from Britain, which we were discussing earlier in the before we started is not functional necessarily. So what might be some Indian systems of governance is a topic of research of mine. Um, and businesses tend to be either family transmitted very successfully. Most of the, re the revival of Indian commerce is family businesses or businesses belonging to a jati. You know, you'll find, you go to Ludhiana, there's a certain community and they are doing the hosiery business very successfully and you go somewhere else and you'll find a certain community uh, has a certain business 
and they are, on, they are competing internationally very successfully. So how, it's important to understand what are the factors uh, that make Indian commerce uh, successful, what are the strengths that Chinese have over us, what are the strengths we have over them. This type of uh, discovery of Indian civilization is not for nostalgia, it is not for chauvinism, it is not for politics, but all of these examples I'm giving you are quite practical and quite useful. So, um, the search, with all these in the back of my mind, a major event was about 10 years ago in Bangalore, in Indian Institute of Sciences, I was asked to give a talk on, uh, the title was very interesting, Where is India in the Clash of Civilizations? And that's because the Clash of Civilizations was a new term because of uh, the new book by that title that we all know, Samuel Huntington's book. And people wanted to know where is India in the Clash of Civilizations. So I was asked to give a speech. And I, uh, the Clash of Civilizations as discussed in the popular works is a clash with, among three civilizations. And India is not part of that. It's Western civilization with America as the main one in the West versus Chinese civilization versus Islamic civilization. These are the three competing civilizations. In the sense that each of them has ambitions to take over the world. Each of them says that they have some paradigms, they have some, something unique to offer, something different, and this should be universalized. Everybody should be under them. And the India, even during the time when it had such a huge economy, such a huge manufacturing base, such a huge amount of wealth, did not have global ambitions. So the question comes, where is India? If there are these three big civilizations that have global ambitions, where is India in that, does, where does India fit? So this got me uh, thinking about this, and I've been working for a decade, and the book is a product of that search. So Western universalism, which is the one that is probably the, which is the dominant in, in the world today, Western universalism is the product of the West's history its own peculiar circumstances, its own ge geographical circumstances, its wars, its conflicts, uh, a very exclusive religion that could not tolerate science and then had to make peace with science in, in, a, in separate domains. Uh, so, you know, the synthesis of uh, prof prophets from the Judeo-Christian side with revelation, with uh, Greek thought, which was rational, coming from a different side, these two had to be synthesized. So the West is a product of its own peculiar background. And Western thought, therefore, is the result of all that. But because the West colonized the world, it spread this influence and it became seen as universal truth. So what was valid and relevant and useful for the West, and it's good for them that they solve these problems in a very nice, innovative way, became seen as though this is the universal truth. You know, it's not only Christianity's claim of universality, but also the Enlightenment movement, the secular movement, with founding fathers like Hegel, uh, claiming that uh, the West was inherently superior, and this idea of uh, history goes in a linear way, with the West always at the top. Uh, this sort of a universal grid became quite normative in the Western mind, and it was spread all over the world. Uh, the English language helped to spread it. Uh, people reading Western history and, and Western thought. Uh, in India, if you go to philosophy departments today, most of the philosophy taught is Western philosophy. If you go to uh, sociology departments, anthropology departments, political science departments, most of the theories are coming from the West. So the humanities are kind of colonized by Western universalism. So the term I've coined, Western Universalism, refers to all this. It's the, it's the assumption that the West's experience is the universal experience, and that's the gold standard against which we should measure ourselves. And that's, the, uh, that's what we should all strive to become. So now you will find in India even aesthetics, even dress, even fashions, even brands, even uh, you know, uh, skin creams to become white, or all this kind of stuff, is the westernization of aesthetics also. Uh, you'll see it in, uh, I think the men kind of sold out earlier 
women kind of held to their tradition, but now I think the women are also moving in that direction, especially the very young women. It's, it's unfortunate, but I find uh, many of my nieces, many of the people who are teenagers, women, in, young girls in this country, I've heard one of them tell the mom that if I wear a sari, I'll, I'll, people will think I'm the servant, you know, I'm a maid, that kind of thing. So the westernization has gone down into that level. Um, in Delhi, when I, uh, uh, every time I visit, my drivers, the, my mother's drivers, kids, they're there. So I go and say namaste. And the driver says, uncle ko, good morning bolo. So it's very important uh, kind of to uh, show the, by example, the rural areas are trying to become urbanites and the urbanites are trying to become Americans. So it is a, it is a process that is, that is going on. Now, um, challenging Western universalism is not only Islam. Islam is doing it not through science and technology, but through religious ideology. But more importantly that I'm studying is the challenge from China. Because China is doing it through science and technology. China is saying that we are going to be capitalist, we are going to be free market, but not westernized. They are creating something called Confucian modernity. Con using Confucian thought, which is their ancient thought, as the foundation, the philosophical foundation, and creating a bridge between Confucian thought and modern science, technology, modernity, and so on. So what they are teaching their ki kids is that when we become modern and when we become technically bright and have more patents and all that than anybody else, don't, say, don't think that we are westernized because this is part of our Confucian ethos. So this is very interesting. Uh, there is a Harvard professor I know, his name is Tu Weming, and he has coined these terms Confucian ethic, Confucian modernity, and China has set up uh, 100 Confucian institutes around the world. India doesn't have one. They are looking for a collaborator. They haven't found one. But in most countries, you will find that China has something called Confucian Institute through which they are propagating this ideology, which is sort of their uh, re response to Western universalism. So, you know, you have these competing universalisms, these competing global ideological, uh, you know, worldviews. The question is, where is India? And does India have such a worldview? Is India to be simply mapped into the West? Because the West has studied India for so long. You know, their social scientists have been coming, their evangelists have been coming, travelers have been coming. And, and you know, studying India and mapping it into their terms, into their terms of reference. Language has been, you know, mapped onto English, most of, many of the words. And a lot of the Indian ideas have lost their Indianness and their flexibility because they're mapped onto the West. For instance, Jati and Varna are not the same as caste. Caste is a European concept which was brought. The word caste is not a Sanskrit word, it doesn't exist. Jati Varna exist. So Jati Varna had a lot of fluidity and flexibility also. Uh, but when it was turned, turned into caste, it became sort of rigid. So a lot of mapping onto the European framework has also rigidified the Indian, Indian culture. So the question is, is there, is there a viability, is there a vibrancy of something Indian? And if so, what is it? And is it useful? Because if you don't ask this question, by default, we are getting digested. Uh, I have coined a phrase in this book called being digested, which means one civilization gets digested into another. It's the metaphor of... Uh, a tiger eating a deer and digesting it. So when the tiger is, has digested the deer, there is no more deer left. The deer is finished. The tiger is a strong, healthy tiger. And when people ask me what's wrong if we get digested, maybe they will also change. They will also learn our stuff and become mild and gentle like us. And I tell them that when the tiger is finished eating the deer, it's not like a mild, gentle deer. It's still a tiger because it's got a DNA. And the deer's DNA has to be broken down through the enzymes and in the digestive system, broken down into smaller and smaller parts until there's no more, no more deer DNA left. And what you have is a lot of spare, lot of spare parts, raw material, 
which gets reconstituted into tiger DNA and stored as blood and bones and flesh for the tiger. It becomes part of the tiger. And then what did not fit is excreted as waste. So if you take this analogy and apply it to civilizations, many civilizations are finished now. For instance, the European pagans you know, were finished off because what was considered useful and what could, be, what could fit into the Christian DNA it became part of Christianity, like the Christmas tree came from the pagans, Easter came from the pagans, much of Christian symbolism came from the pagans, but the pagans themselves are gone. Similarly, if you look at the uh, Native Americans, a large amount of Native American civilization was digested into the European settlers who came from England. And uh, while they digested a large part of uh, Native American culture, the Native Americans are gone. They're finished. So these digested civilizations live in museums. They're not thriving. They're not really alive. They're living in museums. So if there is a scenario which says if a lot of Indian stuff that is useful is plucked apart, taken apart, it, does, it is not one unified entity, but pulled apart, fragmented, and different fragments are digested. Uh, then what is left is a depleted civilization and not, uh, does not have all of its key ingredients together in one place. Uh, a book I'm doing is on how the study of Indian yogis and Buddhist meditators is the latest, uh, la it's at the cutting edge of Western neuroscience and cognitive science. A huge amount, the frontiers of cognitive science and neuroscience today is based on, if you look at who are the pioneers, the top five or ten top scientists and pioneers, all of them 20 or 30 years ago were in places like Rishikesh or they were in Dharamsala learning meditation and they were, they were reading these ancient texts and then they were doing research on the meditators and writing papers, replacing the, replacing the Indian words with their own words, getting patents on it. Uh, getting a lot of grants from the Western scientific establishment. And so a whole new neuroscience and a whole new cognitive science is being created very rapidly. Uh, the Indian sources that have helped do it are erased. And this, uh, this, is a, this is like a huge digestion or a hu huge absorption going on in which the source tradition is, is forgotten. And the interesting thing is most Indians don't know this. Most Indians do not know. Uh, the Indian origins of a lot of things. For instance, there is a prominent American thinker called Harold Gardner. Many of you might have heard of him. He, he came up with the term multiple intelligences. And he's a very favorite uh, speaker for a lot of corporate groups. And when I was in Bangalore, Chen, uh, uh, Infosys had him there giving to talks and the newspaper was full of how you know, his theories are very important for us to understand now, what people don't know is that Sri Aurobindo had developed this idea that a personality has many planes and parts and wrote a book called Planes and Parts of Being, which says that you have many things, many parts in you, many planes of existence in you. And this idea, along with the Nat Shastra, which is the whole uh, the Shastra of theater and aesthetics, also has many rasas, many different kinds of rasas described. So what Gardner has done is renamed it multiple intelligences. And his theory of multiple intelligences, being a Harvard guy, got promoted very widely all over the world. He's considered the fa father of a whole new breakthrough in education and in understanding the nature of intelligence. Uh, and so he's uh, not only the guru of all this in the West, but also in India. But this audience is sitting in India cheering all this have no clue that much of this comes from their own heritage. In fact, there's a, huge, there's a lot more in the Indian heritage, which we, if we were to tap into that, we could go well beyond Gardner. Because Gardner got only a superficial, he scooped a certain amount and westernized it and got all the credit. But what he left behind is a lot more profound, and we don't know about it. So I'm looking at uh, uh, how India is being gradually digested in bits and pieces. And I'm chasing these leads, whether it's education, whether it's uh, psychology, whether it's neuroscience, and so on. Mathematics is another one. Astronomy is another one. Uh, you know, 
we, we are very, a buzzword we hear is nanotechnology, right? Nanotechnology is, if, you are, if you have a physics background, that's when you use physical processes to create uh, materials that are so small, like at the nano level, that they are made of individual molecules put together, very, very tiny. And nanotechnology is the future technology. Now, uh, some people are beginning to understand that uh, a kind of nanotechnology existed in India, but not using physics, instead using chemistry. So one example of a nanotechnology is the steel pillars, which haven't rusted for over a thousand years. An IIT professor, uh, Bala Subramaniam, who unfortunately passed away two, three years ago, uh, he did our volume, our foundation's volume on steel. So what he was researching is how the steel has preserved itself for in all, just sitting in outside in rain and sun and all of that, and the original inscriptions and markings have not rusted, there's no wear and tear, how come this has happened? And Ford Motor Company gave him a grant to study the production of uh, steel that does not rust for a thousand years. They wanted to understand because it would help build engines and things like that. And so he was uh, really looking at how the steel is made, and one of his discoveries is that there's a phosphorus layer which is invisible to the eye, but there's a very thin phosphorus layer on the steel pillar, which is a few microns. So it's a kind of a nanotechnology level of phosphorus layer. So the question is, how did they make it? And they did not have the modern nanotechnology methods and machinery available to make it. So he thinks that they had some, they put some pastes there was, it was more a chemical process. They put, they, they put some pastes of certain things around it. And over a period of time, with the, with the atmosphere reacting, uh, this thing fell apart. But a little thin film, a very thin film survived. This is a nanotechnology of that age. So now it's created a lot of excitement that maybe you can use chemistry to create nanotechnology and not just physics. That would make it a lot cheaper to have nanotechnology. Now I'm sure if it were not for intervention of a few people, uh, like there's a professor in University of Massachusetts uh, whom I work with, and he's very keen in discovering, he's an Indian, so he's gotten very excited and he's trying to document these things. But if it were not for a few people who are, guarding, who are taking this interest, uh, it would come out as some new Western breakthrough, and they would have the patents and they would be selling it to us, and people in India would be very honored and very grateful that they are bringing this technology to us. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in uh, uh, the issue of whether India is being digested, whether its know-how is being digested, culture is being digested, and reformulated as Western, and then remarketed back to India as Western. This is something I'm, uh, I'm interested in. Uh, so if you look at my, it is called being different, and, when, and the, the reason for being different is to prevent being digested. Uh, if you are not different, if you are the same, or if, you are, if what was different about you has been converted into, what, into the same, if you have been reformulated and repackaged into a Western universalism uh, uh, formulation, then you get digested. So the counter to being digested is to be different. Okay, so that is what the book is about, is how we are different, and I've just explained to you why being different is, is, is important to me. So the, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through um, what are all the differences. The book is about what is different about India. And I've, I've come up with four major kinds of differences, and each of them is a separate chapter in the book. So I'll let you read the book. What I've just told you is a sort of preface as to why it matters. And I cite in this book Gandhi as an example of being different. Gandhi used words that were not, he did not translate. He, when they asked him, what are you doing? When the British judge asks him, they, they imprison him and they ask him, what are you doing? He says, Satyagraha. So they ask him, what is that? So he does not translate it. He, he keeps giving a long description of what is Satyagraha. So he's dealing with the British on his own terms. And he's very comfortable doing that. And what will, what will that achieve, they ask? Well, it will achieve Satantarta and Swaraj. So he's got his own vocabulary, which he's not translating. 
And even his dress, his demeanor, his lifestyle, what he ate, when he went to England to meet the King, King George V, uh, you know, on the ship, he took his goat with him. So he's, he's, he's comfortable being different. He's comfortable being who he is. And he doesn't have to prove himself that he's also become like one of them. So Gandhi is sort of a quintessential uh, p different person uh, who wants to remain non-digestible. He does not want to become a, a you know, a, a Gora Saab, Bada Saab kind of thing. That was the, uh, the direction of Jinnah and Nehru. They, they were anglicizing and Gandhi was remaining native. So this is a, an important part to, of Indian history is the Gandhian uh, ideals and ethos versus the Nehruvian. And India was at the crossroads to choose between the Gandhian approach to developing India, which would have been villages, water, water grid, empowering the bottom pyramid, versus the Nehruvian, which was very centralized planning, urbanization, and things of that kind, and while neglecting the villages and neglecting the, the, the farming and agriculture and you know, education of villagers and tradition and so on. So the Gandhian versus Nehruvian uh, ideological difference can also be mapped as uh, Gandhi wanted to be different and Nehru wanted to be digested. So that's a, a good example of the kind of thing that I'm, I'm working on. So the, having lived in the West, I, uh, I've lived there for 40 years and I've always come to India every single year, tried to come as many as four times a year. Uh, I've never stopped being an Indian in my ethos and in my way I project and talk. And I've never found it to be a handicap. I've always found it to be an advantage to be able to explain who I am in my own ways and hold my ground in any international forum, any international forum. And I did this even way back when I was not uh, a big shot. I was always clear about who I am. And I found that if you have enough knowledge and if you have enough confidence, actually the Westerners respect you more. They respect you more for, uh, nowadays it's become even fashionable to glamorize India. So I think there's a window for Indian entrepreneurs and businessmen and um, cultural ambassadors and scholars and gurus, all kinds of people who are on the global stage. There's an opportunity to project a, what is distinct about India without being embarrassed or having an inferiority complex, uh, without having a chip on your shoulder and feeling arrogant and chauvinistic either, but being very natural matter of fact and saying, you know, this is what is distinct about our culture, this is what we, is distinct about your culture, there are good things on both sides, there are bad things on both sides, but this is who we are. I think as Indian businessmen encounter others on the world stage, you will find the Chinese uh, businessman is very clear on what it means to be Chinese. He's very clear on that. The Japanese has never forgotten that he's Japanese. Even though very sophisticated in science and technology, the Japanese have been very Japanese in their, in their uh, culture, cultural identity. And the French uh, does not want to be mixed up as an Englishman. He, if you try to tell him that you're the same as an Englishman, he'll, he'll be insulted. And the Russian is very clear on what is special about his heritage. So it's the Indian I find in many gatherings who's very confused. And so the idea of Indianness is either reduced to uh, Bollywood, Shah Rukh Khan, or cricket, or something like that. But a deep understanding of Indian civilization, I find, is often lacking. And, and uh, this is one of the reasons I'm talking to uh, corporate people, besides talking to uh, academics and media and other kind of intellectuals, but also corporate people, because I have that background. And I feel that rather than thinking of it as baggage, you can think of your identity as, a, as an asset. Uh, the world is now in a state of flux. There is the Western universalism model is in crisis because the West has all kinds of problems. In fact, in the 1960s, there was a crisis of myth in the United States. The Vietnam War, the Watergate crisis, civil rights movement, women's lib movement, all kinds of uh, challenges to the myth of American greatness. And, and so that is when a lot of hippies came to India, a lot of people started looking east for answers because they had doubt about whether or not they have all the answers. So th th we are seeing a return of that era. We are seeing in this decade 
Again, young people, like my kids are born and raised in the United States, so I spend a lot of time talking to young people. They're having doubts about whether they're on the right track as a nation. And they're looking here and there for answers. So once again, 50 years after the previous uh, event in the 1960s, we have another similar window in which India may be a supplier of solutions. India may be a supplier of new approaches to, uh, to, que to augment, if not challenge, the Western universalism. So in, it is in that context that I'm uh, writing this book and giving these talks. Uh, I, I think I've spoken for a long time and I would love to take questions. The four differences that uh, are the back, the, the, you know, the core of this book I have not dis discussed. You should read there or we can discuss them if you're interested in the Q&A. Uh, but I would like you, uh, but those are the, those are the real backbone I feel of what makes our civilization distinct. Yeah. Thank you very much. I would love to take any questions.